Hello and welcome to Happy Times and Places, a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydock, get a friend to choose a Doctor Who story, nominate in secret their favourite things about it, and as I commentate, I have to try and guess what those favourite things might be. My name is Fraser Gregory, I am a part-time podcaster. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can find me on The Diamond Be Praised, uh, Gallifrey's Most Wanted, Doctor Who Literature with Jason Miller, uh, The Trap One Podcast, uh, but mostly you will find me on A Hamster with a Blunt Pen Knife with my good friends Joe Ford and Simon Hart. Today I have come to discuss my favourite story from season 18 of Doctor Who, which is Megloss. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's part three of Meglos. The Doctor is in a sticky situation, but that's because of all the, uh, what is, uh, aloe vera (laughs) uh, coursing through his veins now that he is a cactusy plant called Meglos, a Zulfathurin, who has seemingly stolen a dodecahedron from the savants and the deons who inhabit the vegetable-ridden planet of Tigella. And if if that's not Doctor Who in a crazy nutshell, a nut, (laughs) uh, it is a very nutty premise, uh, uh, appropriate for Doctor Who's nutshell uh, in season 18 of Doctor Who, which is being celebrated by Fraser Gregory. It's his favourite story of season 18, he says. It is probably no, is it nobody else's favourite story of season 18. Don't write it if it's yours. But um, uh, I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, everything is somebody's favourite something. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't have any of the dislike for Megloss that uh, often abounds. I mean, I used it as a shorthand for Bad Doctor Who in uh, my second Doctor Who show, My Stepson Stole My Sonic Screwdriver, but that was partially due to circumstance and storytelling. Um, my, my stepson took a bit of a liking to it. So uh, he did put it on uh, on kind of repeat when I was recuperating from a very, very unpleasant outbreak of psoriasis. Uh, and I came back from hospital and was sort of covered in unguents and in too much pain to move so I was pretty much sort of on the sofa in a dressing gown uh as a, you know f- falling asleep waking up um and 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 kind of not moving very much and uh, when Ethan came home from school he would uh, he would grab whichever dvd he was in the mood to watch over and over and over and over again and uh, it happened to be megloss so I I kind of reverse engineered it into the show so that when that moment came at the end of the show it was a kind of comic uh it was a it, 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 it was a kind of it, i was able to do so with a certain sort of comedic ruefulness uh so that it was a sort of bittersweet uh, happy kind of ending i mean i don't you know it it probably is my is it my least favorite of uh as, well i probably say it's the it's the one i think is probably of the lowest quality but that doesn't mean but that that's a conundrum isn't it because i was because I, there are stories that i admire for their craft and think are well written and well directed and elegantly done that i might think that i might watch less than i might watch M- megloss which i think is is you know great fun although it's not a story i watch an awful lot but certainly when i watched it this time around in preparation for this i don't always watch stories in preparation for this um, I just, you know, I know everything well enough. I think I've watched everything dozens of times. I'm afraid, um, but but actually, I I, I thought no, I because I, I haven't watched it for a while. I will watch it for pleasure first, so I don't I don't lose an opportunity to watch it for pleasure by watching it for <laughs> in inverted commas work. And um, you know, it's thoroughly entertaining. I I I I I think its problems come from the fact that it's not. Uh, it's perhaps not consistent. It 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 it, it doesn't it, it doesn't quite cohere like perhaps the rest of season eighteen, and perhaps that's what its issue is. Uh, whereas everything else is is sort of uniform to the season and within itself. But uniform is not necessarily Doctor's strength anyway. And I think you know I I maybe think Keeper of Traken is a better production, and it's certainly more sumptuous looking, and it has a certain you know, elegance in its dialogue and uh, 
uh, and and certainly it's uh, you know it's costuming and design. But I think I'd probably rather watch Meglos, even though I think Keeper of Trakin is, you know, if there can be such a thing, better. Uh, so that's the beauty of Doctor Who. But I'm not going to call it a guilty pleasure. Uh, I, do, I perhaps do because why would you feel guilty about anything that you enjoy? It just goes to show that when it comes to entertainment, um, you know what what is good because I'm I'm afraid and we sometimes lose sight of this. We aficionados of old television. If something gets loads of viewers and loads of talking, people talk about it, even if we think it's awful <laughs> because it's popular. Um, being popular is not as easy as it looks otherwise we'd all be making popular television programs um now obviously i i would prefer it if we made it higher if we made higher minded stuff popular but then again i'm saying that as somebody that's about to watch for the 30th time uh, a children's television sci-fi series in which an intergalactic cactus uh, uh disguises itself as a as a slightly wayward and occasionally bored actor uh, uh, amidst some very small jungle sets and some leftover costumes uh, thrown over some character actors who are trying their best to uh, uh, mess, mess about in a containable way uh, in a story about, yeah, cactus versus maths. Ah, so, um, you know, high mind your way out of that one, Toby. So I'm going to watch from the beginning. It's episode three of Meglos, and I'm going to press play in three, two, one. Um, so here we are. The Starfield is only seven episodes in, and it still it still feels because again because it's one. It, the Tom Baker in the Starfield is 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 not a is not a title sequence I'm hugely used to these days because I don't watch season eighteen an awful lot and because it was new to me I've it's it's funny listen I've been listening to um uh, a podcast today where uh, they were talking about the eighties happens to be the blunt pen knife and um, sort of getting nostalgic about the neon logo but to me it's 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 new you know it's new and newfangled and i understand john nathan's desire to you know drag doctor who into the 1980s but of course anything you do to try and make something new you know in in in, in not much time it it sort of dates itself which is why i i feel you know the pre starfield titles because you know that they're not looking they're not they, they they don't seem to me to be trying to be 70s or 60s they try they seem to me to be trying to suggest space and time which is obviously not tied to a particular decade so they do seem a bit more timeless than what you get post john nathan turner but you know john nathan turner was was trying to reinvent doctor who along more serious and more uniform lines which are which are all perfectly reasonable things to want to be doing this jungle set's actually not not too bad uh, 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 and and you know when it's shot up close it looks okay i mean i'm sure to modernize you know they 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 don't see through any of the sort of studio lighting and any any idea that this is even vaguely outside would be laughable to a modern audience but i was uh, you know, I was broke, brought up in this sort of thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I would see, I would see jungle, and it is a decent jungle, but the lighting, the hue, it's the hue of VT, can't convince you that you're outside. There's something in the air that when you're outside that VT would pick up, uh, that that isn't in the air in a sort of sterile in, interior studio environment. Uh, these and and you know little things like. A, a breeze you know uh slightly dappled moving natural light you know it's it's but but this is what i was brought up on and it's fine um i, I mean I, I you know and i was again i was brought up on planets being represented by you know two or three spokespeople uh and i think they do a, court crawford logan's a lovely chap 
Uh, he was in he was in The Woman in Black, which, as I record this, is about to close at the West End after years and years and years. And all sorts of Doctor Who people uh, starring in it. Murray Watson, uh, um, John Nettleton, I think, uh, opened it. Um, uh, um, Brian Miller was in it for years and years. And currently it's Julian Forsyth, who's not been in Doctor Who, but he was a great fr- friend of uh, Bernard Case. He spoke at Bernard Case's funeral. So Julian is uh, is closing it, I think, before it goes on tour. But I know Richard Franklin was understudying uh, uh, it at one point, uh, as was a guy called Anthony Verner, who uh, who uh, used to go out with Deborah Watling, but was also a um, he's he's an ice soldier in uh, in uh, Keys of Marinus. Uh, but he'd left the company by the time that I was interviewing Crawford. Um, so unfortunately, I missed Anthony Verner. Um, who would have who would have added to my roster of keys of Marinus people? Um, um, nice, yes. I, 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 that's the repeated bit of business here, which is quite strange because it, it kind of makes the extras into extras. You know, they're reacting to them like they're you know they are they're being obstructive but they they can't actually say anything to them because they're they're non-speaking artists so again it's slightly theatrical but i find all of that stuff quite comforting um they they are quite a an eclectic bunch they're a sort of multi-ethnic bunch the uh the gas tax um now of course again you say now oh it's typical that you know any you know the, a, a rare attempt to uh, to to show a, a, multiple ethnicities is when you've got a ragtag bunch of pirates but nonetheless anything that changes the the sort of physiognomical landscape of uh, of television at this time is is to be applauded even if in, in execution we go yeah but it would wouldn't it have been nicer if say all the rational scientists on Tigella had been you know people of you know multi-ethnic or whatever but anyway uh it's if if nothing else, giving those actors work in a bit of representation, those those supporting artists work in a bit of representation. It's a it's a small thing, but it's uh, it's worth commenting on because it's it, you know it's not it's not hugely common at the moment. Uh, so this is Tom being Doctor Who. Uh, 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 and now actually the uh, <laughs> this is quite funny the whole planet rotation thing. I, I mean, it's it's funny that that Nathan Turner wanted to get rid of sort of university humour, as they called it, of uh, of season seventeen. I I I like Romana and I like Lala Ward. I think she's she's very witty and funny and obviously very intelligent. Um, but but I I think that I can understand why people might not warm to that sort of. That that air of sort of prep school self satisfaction that uh, that Romana too exudes. Ah, oh, that's great. Again, I love that. But Tom as Meglos looks magnificent. Um, uh, and and I remember the I remember this as a kid. This idea of the Earthman trying, you know, the plucky, you know, bank manager um, trying you know and succeeding on occasion in undermining the sort of cruel galactic plant beast um is to me a very doctor who thing it's a very doctor who thing that a, a sort of very ordinary you know british looking bloke uh it's not the it's not the biggest part he doesn't do an awful lot but he has those moments and they're amongst the moments i remember from watching it first time and you know, nowadays Doctor Who celebrates our, you know, our plucky humanity. It's kind of, it's kind of part of the selling point of the show of, of a, a, because we're we're a little bit more. I want, I, I I do actually think in this uh, this early part of the twenty first century, ha- having, you know, having worried about being downtrodden and being hard on ourselves, we are now a little bit more self congratulatory. Uh, so, but but here, but and and so there's a you know that, that and that's not Doctor Who. There's a lot of that in a in 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 a lot of what we do in a lot of self expression in a lot of artistic expression. It's about the individual um, sort of you know celebrating themselves, which um, I'm not sure how I feel about, but I understand where it's come from. 
um, in the same way that ah now this I, I remember this as well because and I, and I buy that again this is quite theatrical the idea that she won't say anything and will be led away but the suggestion is she's so terrified uh, and look at him look at that stare that he's giving her um, uh, but if you've watched Doctor Who before you think she's dead I mean, you think she has been led to her death. And quite often people are so scared they will silently be led to their doom or, or, or allow a creature to consume them or whatever. And again, it's it's part of the grammar of the way that we tell these stories. Uh, uh, and, and it's certainly a memorable moment. And I think it's, uh, you know, t Tom Baker's looking very leering and uh, discomforting and alien uh, and, and powerful and actually very, very scary. Uh, well, and because I'm not the doctor, uh, yes, I am. I, I mean, I that's that's that is sort of nicely alien the way that he sort of yells that and stares. But I'm not sure there's there's much method to that performance because the previous line he's delivered is very Tom Baker as the doctor going because I'm precisely not the doctor. But yes, and uh, <laughs> I mean there is. The, 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 you know that's that's I think I think that's quite fun where you don't you don't actually see and what's ah oh, I love the way his smile turns into a deadpan scariness but I like the way he opens his hand and you don't actually see what's there and it's all reliant on Karis's response I I, th I think that's a really effective scene I like her um, t Tom Baker's really scary it's yeah it's good it's good um, that rather than and rather than sort of just show you, because we kind of know the dodecahedron's gone. He's holding something in his hand. But it's still just, I mean, it's just a way of keeping it interesting. Um, yes, but I, th yes. So, yes, the, I, I like the humble nature of the, that little bit of plucky humanity uh, sort of managing to escape and managing to stop the, uh, there's, there's a gas tank there just waiting just waiting as though he was obviously he was just waiting for his to do his cue there he was that's bizarre because they were all obviously they were all sort of going through and maybe there wasn't room at the back for them all so he was just standing waiting to join them at the end um and one of them i mean they're all wearing they've all been in the rebus operation haven't they um the guy behind frederick treves is wearing shellac's hat um yeah, this is all. They've they've basically the the gas tax have clearly been to the planet Rebos uh, and and stolen their outfits from everybody who lives there. Poor old Prentice Hancock's, he's kept hold of the Jethric, but he's had his hat stolen. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and actually, Binro the heretic would have had something to tell them about the uh, going anti clockwise. But I quite I I do think it's quite witty, but it is in that slightly patronising wittiness which I would call sort of university humour, uh, if I wanted to, uh, of, of, um, of, of, of Romana leading them. That's a nice, that's a nice shot actually with the, and that's a nice piece of orchestrated action with the, the, the Dion's coming and having the close up and then looking up and down. There's actually some quite inventive use of camera in what is a very limited set of spaces. It does feel quite sort of tight in the studio, this whole thing. And he's doing his best with his, camera and his you know half dozen extras um one of whom uh we were one of whom we got the close-up of when uh when they approached the camera in that scene before is uh is ray knight who actually ran a, a, an extras agency and ray knight you can spot um he's he's sort of got bald red red hair but balding he's also in dragonfire as well i think but he was the barman in our fweda zane pet for a bit as well who would occasionally sometimes get a line and a credit and i was always pleased when he did um but ray knight actually ran i don't know if he still does even uh ran an extras agency and would also sometimes you know hawk himself out as well uh so ray knight is quite recognizable if you watch television a lot in the 80s um uh, but yes, I, I feel I've left that slightly hanging about. I'm, 
I, I, as as somebody that you know found school difficult, and and and, and this is this is important because I, uh, uh, the the cliffhanger here was something I talked about in school and learned a lesson. So we'll get to that when we talk about the cliffhanger. But you know, I always I always felt we we were very. And my grandmother was a Methodist. We were all very much told not to blow your own trumpet uh, and to be be humble. And and as a result. Uh, I think, you know, one has been sometimes prone to be too shy and not blow one's own trumpet enough. And, and I'm terrible at circulating and I'm terrible at networking and all those things. And I, when I see other people who are so good at networking, uh, I, I'm, I'm sad that I never had those skills. This is a use. This is this is a, a, a decently rendered sequence. It's only a moment, but there's a bit of there's a bit of reverse filming with the tendrils. And the, the be- I think the bell plants are a little bit literal. They look like tulips, don't they? Um, I think she was waiting. She was a bit waiting there as well. They're, they're, they're a bit too literal, like flowers you would actually see. But um, in a way, that's quite a good Doctor Who thing to make something that is reminiscent of a plant on Earth, but make it a giant man-eating version. That's all cool. But they are, yeah. I mean, look at that. That's just a. That's just a. It's a giant flower, isn't it? <laughs> and I think. Uh, I mean, they're they're doing their best here, but it's uh, it's slightly tatty. And look how close everybody is. I mean, they've tried to give it some depth to the jungle there, but uh, and and the shooting is quite inventive. But they are struggling for space. They really are. Um, uh, uh, oh, but anything anything that's got a laser gun. Um, but uh, but now, of course, to 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 to, to you know the my generation has said to kids you know don't be shy i try and be creative you don't have to you know always be uh you know good at the stereotypical things of your of you you know g- girls don't all have to be good at cooking boys don't all have to be good at sports so because a lot of us particularly a lot of people that went into the arts were people that that didn't you know weren't comfortable in those stereotypes and so he said you know you should celebrate yourself and not be afraid of being you know uh artistic or 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 dare i say it not very good at some things um but 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 of course the danger there is you have a lot of people who aren't very very good at much uh but being a little bit too self-confident uh dis- despite having not an awful lot to be self-confident about so you have to be careful which way the pendulum swings or again maybe i'm just old <laughs> uh, i i absolutely remember this from the first time i think that is such a simple uh image uh, that, uh, but but that you know is it works perfectly with the story, to- and Tom as Megloss is a great great image. Um, yeah, well done, Karis. Uh, well, that's a very funny odd shaped gun, though, isn't it? Um, uh, but this is you know the story, and it's weird because the next episode of this is really strange and very short. But this feel likes it's sort of building to a conclusion. We've got. You know, the gas tax are attacking the city that that has lost all of its power because its power source has been stolen by the monster that's disguised as the doctor. Uh, You know, it's feeling like it's building to a a, a real climax, which means and and I love I love laser beams. Um, I mean, this fight uh, is (laughs) I mean, they don't need guns. They could they don't need to shoot each other they could poke each other's eyes out with their guns and this is quite a use this is quite a a, a nifty use of the mistaken identity thing uh I, I mean again that's a very you know theatrical thing there that poor old Karis gets hit on the back of the neck me and my friend anton we always used to pretend to be peter lupus from uh uh uh, uh mission impossible oh there we are uh, bill fraser kicking canine that was his that was his condition for taking the job um it's oddly staged that though she's just run into a, a whole room full of gas tax and they've sort of ignored her um but yeah but my friend anton and i used to pretend to be peter lupus from mission impossible and so we go we've come to mend your telephone and then you know karate chop somebody between the shoulders and they'd fall unconscious and there we have the dodecahedron i wonder if it's actually the same one from the Carl Sagan program, because he actually has a little a little model uh, dodecahedron where he explains all that uh, maths that I tried to explain in uh, in the previous episode of Happy Times and Places, where uh, Carl Sagan talked about the 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 threatening aspect of that particular shape to the Pythagoreans, who were the the ancient maths guys. Now then. I learnt an important lesson with episode three of Megloss. I've talked about this. There's Ray Knight uh, next to the guy who's putting the 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 tor- flaming torch in there. Uh, he's he's b- 
balding red head underneath that, but you can't see because he's got a cowl on. But he's quite a distinctive looking fellow. Um, uh, I I went into school the day after this or whenever it was, not the day after this, a couple of days after this. And I was in junior school and I said to Mrs. Jones, so, you know, we had to write about what we'd done that weekend. And I said, I watched Doctor Who, but uh, uh, they ended it when the flame was burning through the rope and this stone's going to crush Doctor Who. And why? Why? You know, why, why, why? it's so annoying that they left it at that exciting moment because oh, the doctor's in trouble. And she said, well, of course, they leave it at an exciting moment so that you'll tune in to watch it next week. And uh, that that taught me an important lesson it's i mean it is a good job that general grugger as he's about to say lost lost uh, uh, uh l- lost a few men uh that see that smile is quite tom baker to me rather than megloss um but i suppose megloss is assumed the aspect of tom baker but anyway um but if if general grugger hadn't lost some men no, megloss would have nowhere to sit um but yeah mrs J- mrs jones said to me you know yeah this is that you know this them leaving it on the exciting moment will make you tune in next time uh and you know that gave me an inkling that oh you know it's it's not just about the story the storytellers are placing things you know for a reason beyond just that it's a television program that's entertaining there's sort of there's 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 method to it uh and and a method beyond just the simple storytelling you know that's uh there's the, the the idea that there's a hook, the, the idea that there are you know ups and downs and uh, uh, you know moments designed to be there in a particular place, not just because that's what the story was, uh, and of course the idea that there were behind the scenes people controlling all of this. This to me as a kid was so terrifying because you see the rope burn through, uh, or you know, uh, and and you know exactly what's going to happen that when the when the third rope is through that stone is going to crush doctor who this this was you know ab, you know the absolute apex of sort of danger and the fact that you see the rope start to burn and that's it oh you know that's a very memory it's not if you now you know ask me to um you know list all the memorable cliffhangers in the history of doctor who i wouldn't mention megloss episode three but at the time uh, of watching it it was it was huge it was exciting and it was i've got to watch next week how the hell is doctor who gonna get out of that uh so uh there we are that is the end of episode three of megloss i've got to choose oh i've got to choose my favorite thing about episode three of megloss i mean it would be a very personal one to uh to choose the cliffhanger uh i mean i can't really expect fraser to choose the cliffhanger to episode three because i remember talking about it at school the following monday uh i yeah i i I am so i mean i know that terence dudley was not many people's favorite favorite person um i think he was quite tricky and I think as a producer, he did he did make a lot of wrong calls with the shows. He was a sort of typical of the kind of you know you know job job for life uh, you know internal uh, B- BBC staff member creative, uh, and and all that was problematic about that system. Much as there's plenty to celebrate about that system uh, as as well. Um, uh, but I actually think some of his camera work on on that was was really interesting particularly with what felt like um a lack of space uh the bell plants i was expecting to be a bit um dismissive of but but the idea that there are well it's it's a difficult one because i never like doctor when it's a little bit too literal you know you go you, you know it's a, it's an alien and let's just you know let's just make it a bigger version of a, of a, of an earth thing but but actually you know then when you have something that is recognizable from our earth and, and and turned on its head and made threatening i i celebrate that maybe it's because those giant flowers 
look more comical than say a kid in a gas mask or uh, uh, you know a, a murderous telephone flex or all those things that are that are genuinely frightening um whereas there's something about a, a a giant red daffodil that perhaps it would not be haunting my nightmares and either they're not a they're not a, a a monster i think much about and i i seem to call i think one of the books is it the discontinuity guide or 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 yeah i think it might be the discontinuity guide or the program guide or one of the books um talks about how they were the, the, you know the press did make a bit of a deal about them at the time and they end up not featuring very much at all but that that happened with quite a few things i remember thinking of plants the day of the day of the triffids the the, the tv version there was a lot in the pre-publicity made of the triffid gun the anti-triffid gun and it's in like two scenes um so there's quite often things like that that actually more time was spent publicizing them than was actually spent putting them into the programs which seems quite bizarre in this day and age when that sort of stuff is much more sort of formally done and seen through um but I, that means I'm, 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 uh, you know, and, and and a lot of the shortcomings of Megalos are because they are they seem to me totemic of uh, the way that television was made at that time, and and the problems that television makers had at those time those times, and had to use all the skill at their disposal to overcome, which meant that when they did overcome them, you as a viewer were full of admiration and grateful because you knew you know you knew when uh you knew you were watching something there was no, you know there's never attempt to disguise the fact that, that that you were watching people acting on a set you know there was a, it was it was it was it it couldn't it couldn't hide it i mean it there was, yeah there was an unspoken understanding that that there was a certain we we were privy to a certain amount of artifice uh, but when directors, actors, producers, creatives were went to an effort to try and at least break out from the conventions that were dictated by the artifice, we as viewers were were, were grateful. Whereas I think the modern viewer, you know, looks at that and just goes, "Oh, you know, they, they you know, that, that's not very convincing." Well, we we knew it was at a base level, not hugely convincing it would because it was more like watching a stage play in that sense we knew we were watching a production that was being mounted but we we it appealed to us when either the quality of the acting you know made us forget that that's what happens in the theater you forget you're watching actors on stage because because they they transport you with the truth of what they're doing well you know tv drama transports you because the directors either staged it in a really inventive way or or again the actors are doing something really interesting or the writing is such that it seizes your imagination that you it's not that you f you don't know you're not watching something that's real but you 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 forget i mean when we're watching modern television we know we're not watching something real but it, it of course it one of the one of the main focuses is to make you you wouldn't allow a shot in now that 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 sort of that 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 was sort of, that that was self consciously artificial. Sometimes special effect shots aren't pulled off despite everybody's best best hopes or or look a bit look a bit cheap or whatever. But but the the you wouldn't you wouldn't be allowed to have something that looked like it was a set in the way that. I think we, you know, we 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 were more accepting of then, but I still haven't said what I like best about. I do like that scene where the doctor lures Karis in, and then and then shows her the uh, the the the. It's not the doctor. It's it's Meglos. The the that whatever it is that's in his hand i don't know i just find that very memorable but i also like the uh i like the the earth man but i chose did i choose the earth man for episode one the fact that megloss takes over a bespectacled city gent but i like the earth man's rebellion and i do remember that from the time but then again i remember the cliffhanger from the time um i'm i'm, I'm quite liking terence studley's camera movement too uh what shall i choose i i think i like the earth man's rebellion because she's such a small part uh nobody's ever going to talk about the earthling from megloss but i remember that so vividly 
and it and it seemed to me to be a lesson that even you know some an image we would take for granted the you know the besuited city gent everything that seems sort of unthreatening and quintessentially british or whatever that, that humble british thing uh it's not it's not a big patriotic clarion call it's a it's a sort of low-key um you know and, and associated with with sort of you know just old-fashioned manners and that sort of thing could you know have a sort of plucky interior that that was a match for a cruel alien uh, walking cactus um so is it the, is it the earth is it the earth things is that too close to what i chose before uh do i choose the cliffhanger no i'm going to choose or do i choose that scene with caris and the and i haven't even chosen brotterdack yet and i love brotterdack and gregor <laughs> bill fraser kicking canine because <laughs> of all the but you know because that gives a nice little story to why he agreed to do the job and all of that and that becomes part of the mythology and that's quite fun uh, oh no, I chose Jacqueline Hill, didn't I? I chose Jacqueline Hill for episode one. So I'm definitely choosing, yeah, the Earthling's Rebellion and everything that the Earthling represents. Uh, you know, that that image, but also, yeah, that sort of plucky resolve. And and, and it's very Doctor Who either, the juxtaposition between a stereotypical city gent and, you know, spooky alien shenanigans. Uh, and, and because you know that 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 second time when the earthling rebels uh, that image is exactly as it was in my head and i see it there and i go that's i i know i can see it now but that's also what resides in my memory banks from when i watched it the very first time and that's not bad going seeing as i watched it for the very first time when it went out which was oh my god 42 years ago <gasps> i was so i was six. Oh, oh the humanity oh the humanity fraser gregory who i was probably not born when megloss was on uh let's have a look to see what he likes about episode three of megloss will it be the earthling and his rebellion probably not hi again everyone um Time for episode three's favourite thing, and for this one, I have picked Romana's outfit. Um, watching the documentary on the Warriors Gate DVD, Lala's wardrobe, Lala Ward doesn't seem particularly fond of this outfit, but for me, I think this is the best outfit that she was given to wear as Romana. Um, it's a June Hudson classic with the sort of the crimson and the red, which really suits uh, Lala Ward, but it's got those sort of lace sleeves that give it a, a very um, pirate feel which I think fits really nicely with Grugger and the Gaztex and that band of pirates um, obviously the red really does suit her in it it really has this elfin quality that um, is so very Lala Ward she looks gorgeous in it and I think it's a really beautiful costume so that is my favorite thing about episode three of megloss yeah that's not a bad choice I, th I and i don't know why that costume is not talked about uh, i mean i don't i tend not to think of when i think of lala ward's costumes i obviously think of the brilliant uh uh you know sort of nautically one from the leisure hive i love her sort of you know slight shadow of the doctor one in uh, the horns of naimon where she's you know kind of a a, a prototype sort of doctor twin uh the the schoolgirl outfit which i think throws up all sorts of interesting conversations not all of them necessarily comfortable ones in city of death but as an aesthetic it's great um it's it's fantastic there's a, you know some there's lala ward wears some great costumes uh i think she's got a really good eye for costume because i know i think she you know weighed in with her uh, opinions about uh, what she should be wearing and, and collaborated with the costume designers and i know um, had arguments too because I know that Dorian James and her didn't see eye to eye uh, on at least one occasion. Um, but and June Hud June Hudson is an icon of Doctor Who and a marvelous, marvelous person. But also, I think her style very much suits the show, and it uh, and and actually the look of the show 
is is probably more dependent on June Hudson than it is on the set designers really at this in 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 this period sometimes. And uh, whilst I don't like the fact that the Doctor doesn't change costume in season eighteen, I think there's a perhaps an, a, an over over reliance on on that burgundy look that uh, that does then feed into the, the the aesthetic of the rest of the show, which makes season eighteen feel quite sumptuous, which I which I I approve of. I, I also you know I also prefer I think when the Doctor retains a, a basic silhouette but but changes elements of it. And I suppose in this you know at least he doesn't have the jacket on in that opening TARDIS scene, so it adds a little bit to the realism there. But but Romana changes her costumes every time uh, or most times. Uh, and you know Romana's costumes are a talking point indeed they've been the subject of a documentary on the DVD range but um, nobody really talks about that one and it's a beautiful red colour with that lovely then white lace that uh, that complements it so I think that's an excellent choice I don't know why nobody talks about that costume uh, that much uh, and I'm glad that Fraser chose it but it is not what I chose I will now not be able to choose that for episode four um, but if he chooses the earthling if he chooses Jacqueline Hill uh, uh, even if he chooses that bit of music uh, later on you know I, I still could get some points somewhere along the line but I think uh, I have probably uh, I have I have no chance of uh, get, getting this one back um, but uh, you know at least it's not the power source that, uh, <laughs> that that stops me from being destroyed by wanton plant life on the planet I've got to live on for, forever but let's not get let's wait for next episode to, to get into that but anyway um uh, I think I'm going to lose this one, as is the uh, guy that looks like a spiky green version of me. So at least we'll lose together. Uh, but uh, we, you can you can come and bear witness to that as the story changes slightly uh, next week uh, and becomes something else entirely for not a very long amount of time. But that, so it's uh, so tune in on the next episode for truncated times and places but for now for now they're more than satisfied with being happy ones thank you ever so much for listening to happy times and places which is presented by me toby haydock and my special guest fraser gregory who is on twitter at felix fraser fraser with a z i'm grateful to fraser and to the patrons who make these podcasts possible. And they include Jess Jerkovic, Andy Kitching, Ashley Knight, Clive Lewis, Guy Lambert, James Lark, Lisa and Andrew, Gavin McLean, Steve Manfred, David Matthewman, Jason Mayo, John McClay, Rossa McPhillips, Stuart Mitchell, Nathan Moore, Christopher Newman, Matthew Newton, Graham Knott, Dave Owen, Melvin Pena, Jonathan Potter, Kevin Parker, Scott Pride, Dylan Rees, John Rivers, Mark Sandham, Jim Sangster, Keith Say, Graham Slate, David Shepherdson, there's also David Shepherd, there's two of you with almost the same name, Tim Smith, Stephen, Neil Tate, Nick Temple, Damien Timmer, Sabrina Tirabassi, Apollo C. Vermouth, Gary Wales and Adam Westwood. The music is by Dave Gates, the artwork, Dylan Patterson. <laughs> if you're anything like me, you'll find that onions can be a bit difficult, except that I now sign up to Weekly Onions, where I get my onions delivered straight to my door and they take all the complications out of the modern onion consumer's day, of which I've always counted myself. Do you see what you're avoiding if you uh, go to patreon.com forward slash... Well, no, you're not avoiding that. You don't get that on these podcasts. Uh, I do not advertise on these podcasts because... I, 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 my heart always sinks a little. I always, I'm doing it now. I'm doing what the advert people do. Doesn't your heart always sink a little when you listen to a podcast from somebody you respect and then they have to pretend that they personally like a thing? They've been given money to advertise. Uh, but of course, because it's a podcast, they do the personal touch. You go, and I use it, and I can't believe it's the best shave I've ever had. And would you say if it if it wasn't, of course you wouldn't. They've just given you some pounds. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the artifice that I can't, I can't drum up. I can't do. Uh, and also, I, it's just not my my scene or my style. 
um that and that's not to say it's a virtue i i admire very much those people i've not been offered now let me say hang on this is also i've not been offered i've not been off nobody's come knocking at my door and saying please can you endorse my my family friendly genocide you know my 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 uh, <laughs> or whatever it is they want to to uh to 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 kick it. nobody I, you know i'm not i'm not somebody worth hanging trinkets upon in order to make them look more attractive but i think there are ways that podcasts can get uh, advertising for for money but i prefer to do the or maybe they're not no i'm sure there is because i listen to podcasts um that's not what i'm doing here i am instead just asking for money <laughs> uh, the way that podcasts work these days if somebody is a creative person and put something out there they put it out there for free you may be well be listening to this on itunes where it's free i'm very cool about that and i i love the fact that you know as a as a person who makes things you can just really easily because i'm a simpleton uh put it out there and people can listen to it and a lot of you do and i'm really grateful that's the main thing that's the headline thanks for listening but also buy my onions um no um but if you if you do if you are one of those people that uh you know wants to subsidize some of the stuff that you enjoy and consume consider going to my patreon page which is patreon.com forward slash toby Haydock, where you could have heard these words six months earlier than you're hearing them now if you're listening on itunes because happy times and places is six months ahead you could also have heard your name being read on the credits there i know amazing look at what you're being offered but there is also uh, access to uh, a unique patreon only podcast called far too much information and the patreon only ask me anythings which are uh once a month but uh if i get asked lots of questions there's about three editions of those and people seem to listen to those it's bizarre um uh, and there's videos and stuff from my archive and all sorts of other stuff uh and that's at patreon.com forward slash toby uh, another way of doing it where you're not uh committing yourself to a a monthly obligation because patreon is a monthly thing you can pay from three pounds a month uh, you could get a 10 percent discount if you pay for a year in advance but uh, you can you can also you know ascend up the tiers but all of the uh, audio and video content is available to every single tier um at, you know at entry level but you could also go to ko-fi.com forward slash toby Haydock, where you don't get anything except the satisfaction of uh chucking some money my way if i've done something you particularly like uh you know like if i was busking on the tube and you were feeling uh of a particularly sunny disposition towards somebody doing a mick, a mick hucknell cover at old kent road or wherever um and this is my own old kent road my mick hucknell cover is a, a monologue about episode three of megalos uh i've been i've been i've been holding back the tears uh and i haven't been holding back the years though gosh i remember it from when it was first on um and also uh what you can do to support if you don't want to or can't financially and i totally get that times are tough the world is going crazy we're spiraling into all sorts of uh, national and international debt and everything is going up and nothing works properly so do you know what i'm just happy if you know this distracts you from that for a bit he says now just reminding everybody but if uh, you want to show your appreciation you can do so in a in a you know in a very straightforward way that costs you nothing apart from a little bit of your time which is to go to itunes podbean spotify anywhere online and give these five stars five stars really help uh, and a few lines of review to let people know what they're in store for that that is the sort of stuff that points people in the direction of these podcasts and gets more listeners which of course you know is is more fun for me uh, so if you could do that and just spread the world v with a word via cyberspace uh, and indeed word of mouth uh, spread the world spread the world go on yeah start start a chain letter do whatever you like write it in the sand write toby Heddock's time travels in the sand next to your sos uh whatever you know paint it on the white cliffs of dover uh you, you ch chip away at the mount rushmore and make it all my face do and anything just any little thing to help spread the word about toby Heddock's time travels and i would be very grateful 
And those places on cyberspace include Twitter, where I'm on there, at Toby Haydoke. These podcasts have their own feed, at Haydoke Podcasts. I'm also a stand-up comedian by trade during the day. I say during the day. It's not. It's at night time. Uh, particularly at Excess Malarkey Comedy Club in Manchester, which begins at 8 p.m. every Tuesday. If you've got any mates in Manchester, it's been running for 26 years. It's highly regarded. We've always got a fantastic array of comments, comics on, uh, and it's a nice, safe comfortable space to enjoy creative and artistic endeavor that is designed to tickle your fancy and there's there's the theme i'll let the theme do its thing that was actually very fancy i i i got interrupted because i have i have the well i'm doing this in a slightly different way Uh, i was going to reserve this for episode four where i might need to make the time last a little bit longer um I'm rec- these are the first ones, episodes two, three, and probably four of Megalos. I'm recording straight onto GarageBand, where I'm normally recorded them on Audacity uh, and then moved them over to GarageBand. But Audacity started to sort of um, dr- have dropouts in place. Well, it used to have dropouts, um, but it used to show the dropouts, so I'd be able to replace them with my backup recording, which was a fiddle, but it meant... I could see where the dropouts were because I don't like having to listen back to the whole thing just in case a, a syllable drops out. So I need to see the dropouts, but it stopped showing the dropouts now. Uh, and I only noticed a few dropouts recently when I did uh, too much information because I have to listen to those back to do quite a complicated edit. But I don't want to listen to these back. Who wants to listen to me rabbiting on about Doctor Who in an unstructured way? How embarrassing. Um, but that means I can't tell if there's any dropouts, so I can't risk that with Audacity, which for some reason I believed as a better recording. I don't know. But anyway, to avoid the dropouts, uh, I'm doing this on Garage Band, which I normally edit on, uh, to see if there's a change in quality. So is this any worse quality than Megalos 1, than any of the other previous Happy Times and Places? Now, I, I normally do the credits and the plugs and this post-credits bit. They're normally recorded straight into GarageBand, but the main track, uh, you know, the, the commentary itself is normally done on Audacity. So is there a difference? Uh, is there a difference between the quality of those bits and the main recording? I don't know. Who knows? Um I, I know Audacity records onto a WAV, uh, and this this comes out then as an MP3. Does a WAV changing into an MP3 is that is that better quality than just recording this and turning it into an MP3? I don't know, but anyway, that's what I'm doing to avoid the dropouts because I don't think I've ever had any dropouts on GarageBand. Am I right to be recording? I'm, this could be a major sound person's faux pas. I was only doing I do Audacity because I use that sort of professionally. Um, and, and I've got somebody double checking and at the other end and blah de blah um, but anyway um, yeah because I normally actually professionally I record down the line and I back up with Audacity but Audacity has been a bit glitchy it's always been a bit glitchy but now it's stopped showing the dropouts but uh, a sound guy I know has, has sent me um, a link to some better software so I might start using that but uh, I didn't want to experiment on new software now is this interesting i don't know i think fraser is one of the few people that actually listens right to the end so this is the sort of thing that you've this is the beast you've created yourself fraser Uh, (laughs) so anyway uh yes so that but anyway i i thought i did something clever there because i have the music stings lurking because i've got a sort of vague template um i normally stick them right at the end and then sort of move them forward where i need them to to break up these last few bits but obviously i hadn't put that uh, that last sting far enough back i uh, obviously didn't think i'd have been talking this long for a short episode like megalos part three uh, and that piece of music kicked in but then instead of stopping and doing uh, did you see I, I sort of brought it up so that the 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 sting that came in under me talking, which is which is the noise coming from my computer, I then I then faded up into the track itself. That coming from me, coming from me, uh, you know, I I don't exactly have silicon fingers, uh, <laughs> as as I think a nifty piece of editing. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm I'll be dining on, out on that with all my robot friends uh, for, for the next many, many weeks. I'll, I'll stick on Daydream in Blue, that song about being a robot. And, uh, uh, and, and I'll tell them, well, you know what I did with me uh, garage band music interface fading up thing. Uh, anyway, I, I quite liked that bit. I, yeah, 
I liked how that worked. I'm, I'm pleased I was able to get myself out of trouble with a little bit of nifty level manipulation, which is what all the professionals call it. So for me and Meglos and for now, Garage Band, uh, I hope you liked our little robotic coda.